Well, thanks for joining me today on this fine Sunday morning of February the 19th, 2023. This is Needlebug. My name is Karen, and this is a channel all about stitching. Whether we're doing Stitch With Me's or an educational type video, we're just all about stitching. <laughs> so, Thanks for stopping by. Thanks for clicking play. And I hope we have something interesting today that you would want to subscribe and keep coming back. So how is everybody today? I thought today we'd do a bit of a stitch with me on Mr. Frosty. Um, I haven't had him out for a little bit. Well, actually, yes, I have had him out because if you look, that picture is it is awful. <laughs> I hope it looks clearer on uh, your screen than it does on mine. It looks a little wavy and funky, but uh, we're going to go with it. But as you can see, I filled in a lot of... I'm working on his shoulder. So um, I've gotten a little bit done in the last week or two so that I have stitched him. But wow, this week has been an awfully, awfully busy week. Um, didn't get a lot of stitching done, um, but did get some. Oh, pardon me, I had to take a little bit of a drink. Um, yeah, but it was, it was a fun week. Uh, Tuesday, I happened to uh, go down to outside of Lancaster to Stroudsburg and uh, meet up with Country Stitchers, Liz and Deb, and they had their stitching day, or actually it was a, a couple hours. Um, their stitching get together, which was quite fun. Met some old friends that I haven't seen for quite some time. So Lynn, if you're watching this, hi again. <laughs> and uh, it's terrible. I can't remember everybody's name. It's terrible, but made some new friends. I think it's Allison. So if I pronounce, if it's, it's either Alice or Allison. If I am wrong, please forgive me. But it was a joy to get to spend the day with you. And there was Rita who sat across from me. Wonderful, nice lady. And a friend of hers who I didn't catch her name. But there were other people there also. I would guess there was about in the neighborhood of 20 or so people there but it was a fun time and we laughed and we chatted and we just had fun oh 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 i almost forgot almost forgot i spent quite a bit of time talking with ethel and she is the designer of Designs by Ethel. Um, oh shoot, I should have uh, clipped a picture of one of her designs to put on here. She's the one, her designs are a little mouse, a crow in her pictures. And one of them was Christmas oriented with the little mouse. Uh, and yeah, they, the ones I had, there was a Halloween one and a Christmas one. Oh, too cute, too cute. So I spent quite a bit of time talking with Ethel and what a, what a joy, what a joy she is to talk to. And, um, sometime in the relatively near future, Ethel will be on the channel my guest. Um, 
we haven't worked out all the details yet. Uh, I will see her again at another stitching day, the 1st of April at sponsored by HodgePodge, which is the needle workshop in Stroudsburg. And we are in Pennsylvania, by the way. Um, so at that point, Ethel and I will probably finalize or at least make some plans about having her come here and do a live session. And that way, all of you folks will get to uh, ask her questions about her designs, or uh, I think she's even planning on bringing some of them along, some of her um, trunk show. So look forward to that. It will probably be, well, obviously it won't be before April, and it will be sometime after that. But but do look forward to that. We'll be working on that. So it really was a very, very fun day. And thank you, Liz and Deb, for, for sponsoring that and getting everybody together. And I know I truly, truly enjoyed myself. But then again, stitching days are always fun. We are not, mind you, not going to discuss how many stitches Karen stitched. <laughs> because <laughs> um, well, you can only guess because Karen really didn't stitch hardly at all. If I got all of ten stitches done, <laughs> that that was a lot. But is that not? Typical, pretty much, pretty much. But still, it was well worth the drive. Uh, took me about an hour to get there. And again, it took me, of course, an hour to get home. But all very much worth it because it was just so fun. So, how many times after a fun day, do you have a uh, oops day? <laughs> well, that's what happened. Tuesday was such a fun day. And uh, <laughs> my husband had gone to bed and we forgot to turn the dishwasher on. So I turned it on after he went to bed. I'm downstairs here stitching for a while. So now this is probably pretty late. Maybe close to midnight. And I'm in the living room stitching and after a while I come out and to get the you know refresh my beverage, my drink. And I hear this rattling, this ugly, ugly noise. Uh, what the heck is that? So I walk to the the door that goes out on the the back porch where our grill is, thinking it sounds like somebody's rattling in our or at our trash cans that are out there and the recycling can and there's a our grill is on that porch. So I flipped on the outside light. And there's nothing or nobody there that I could see anyway. But I'm still hearing the noise. And what the heck? What the heck? Well, then, right next to the sink built into the cabinetry is our dishwasher. Well, I walked over to the sink, and when I walked over to the sink, I noticed the lights. You know how you, you well, at least our dishwasher does. It The light lights up that it's on a normal wash, and 
whatever other options we choose. And then as it progresses through the wash and the rinse and the whatever cycles, the light, of course, moves across and changes to whatever cycle it's in. Okay. It's not doing that. The lights are flashing. What the heck? That's, that's not right. <laughs> so I turned it off thinking, well, maybe it's just having a hiccup. As things do that are electronic, uh, it's not always the operator. <laughs> Pardon me. So I waited a couple minutes and I went to turn it back on again. And it wouldn't turn on. What the heck? What's going on here? So I hit the cancel button again. Well, this time I opened the door and inside I could hear this hissing, almost like hissing sound. Like things wanted to come through, but they couldn't. What the world? So I try, okay. Silly me tried one more time thinking, okay, let's, let's try and start it again. Maybe it's just, like I said, having, having a hiccup and uh, it wouldn't start again. So finally I turned it off and said, well, the heck with this. We're not, we're not messing with this tonight anymore. So since I am the late go to bed person. My husband is the early go to bed person. Therefore that makes him the early riser and I'm the sleep in later. <laughs> okay, where did I put my scissors? Hold on a second. Gotta get my scissors. Um here they are. Where did I put them? I decided to leave him a note. To say, check the check the dishwasher, but don't don't just go to start it thinking that I didn't check the dishwasher, and I put in the note what what the issue was. <laughs> and when I. When I got up in the morning, he says, yep. I said, yep, what? <laughs> he said, yep, the dishwasher died. <laughs> I said, okay. So that was Wednesday. We spent shopping for a new dishwasher. And, uh, we actually shocked the man at the, we went to an appliance store as opposed to one of the big box stores, um, which we have dealt with in the, well, it's, this was the same store then that we ended, that we bought our current now broken dishwasher from. And they looked it up when we bought the one that uh, bit the dust and that <laughs> that dishwasher was 27 years old <laughs> to which he was quite surprised because right before that he told us that you know dishwashers don't usually last more than than five years and you know, you're really even pretty lucky to get 10 years out of one. And ours was 27 years old. To which then I said, well, you know, when we bought that dishwasher here, we also bought a microwave. Now, they, they were all KitchenAid products. We also bought a microwave and a stove 
to which all are both currently still in the kitchen working. <laughs> To which he was also quite amazed. <laughs> and then I said, well, yes, we got our money's worth. Yeah, I do believe we did. So new dishwasher is arriving on Tuesday this week. So in the meantime, we're actually physically washing dishes again. <laughs> to which, over the last 27 years, we have done very little hand washing of dishes. So, that was another busy day. And then, yesterday, We went to my daughter's to celebrate my granddaughter's birthday, which is, is not till the 27th, but this was the weekend that worked to get family together because they have such, such a busy schedule. Um, Jimmy, my granddaughter, plays on a soccer league that's year-round, so she has soccer camp on the weekends. My grandson, who is so very, very intelligent, has, is in a program called Odyssey of the Mind, and they're getting ready for their local competition. So that would, that's today that they have that. So, and they meet every Sunday. So they're, they're between the kids' things and their things and whatever, they're quite busy right now. So we had Emmy's party a little bit early which was another quite fun day. <laughs> so that's why I finally decided that today is the day I need to, want to do at least a stitch with me. So that's, okay, what did I just do here? So I thought, well, since I'm going to be stitching anyway, I might as well just record it and do a bit of a stitch with me. And I better do that this morning because I would very much like to watch the Daytona 500 this afternoon. be stitching here with and hopefully I will make some progress on this stocking. I am now past 50%. Thank the good Lord. <laughs> you know, I said I was going to make these two stockings. This one will be my daughter's and I still have my son-in-law's to do, which I have a very minimal, very minimal start on. So I still have that one to do. And I said this year I was going to make them a priority. Well, that's my intention. And that is still my intention. However, my friend Barb enabled me to do a cropped version of Cross Stitch Studios' God Shed His Grace. 
which is absolutely beauteous. So I did start that. I did start it. However, I am trying very hard to control myself and not work on it. Um, and go back to my original plan of getting these stockings done this week. And I think I'm over the worst of the confetti on, on uh, Fred. I think because this hair stitching in, in this shoulder is really, really <laughs> a lot of block color, which as you see can go rather fast, especially if you're stitching, if you stitch two handed. And, you know, I will say that for those of you who try it and, and think that you can't stitch two handed, you, you really have to give it a little bit of time because what needs to happen is you need you need to practice because you need to, in order for it to flow and move rather quickly, you have to develop some muscle memory. It's okay. I'm going to, I'm right-handed. So I'm going to use that as an example. I put my right hand underneath when I'm stitching two handed because my right hand is smarter than my left hand. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, I'm right-handed. And up until the point where I started stitching two-handed, I stitched right-handed where I would hold the hoop in my left hand and then move my right hand back and forth, I would stitch like this. I would then bring this hand up and go down and go underneath and pull it through and push it up and go down. So this hand, this right hand got pretty smart. It knows what to do. It knows how to quickly find that hole from underneath. So that's the hand, especially when you're learning, is more than likely the hand to be underneath when you're stitching two hands. As I said, because it's smarter, it knows what to do. And on the top, I have my left hand, which is my non-dominant hand. And I keep that one on the top because it's not as smart. And in order to know what hole to go in and to find that hole relatively quickly, it needs supervision. So it needs my eyes to tell me which hole to go in so that I can see it as opposed to just feeling it. And once you do that often enough, it gets to the point where, as with, with anything, as you learn things, it needs less and less supervision. So that's why my left hand is on the top. Excuse me, I had a drink. As it needs less supervision, you can stitch faster. Because it's You've trained that hand 
on where to go and what to do. So you stitch a little faster as you develop, as you develop the muscle memory. In case you're wondering, this is my newfound way to end my threads without flipping over, which I really do like. So that's been my week rather busy week. Next week is going to probably be just as busy, but in a different way. Because next week I get to go to the dentist. Next week. Um, and get my implant checked so that if everything is all as it should be there, I can get my tooth made to put on it. That will be absolutely wonderful. Because I can feel my regular teeth starting to shift so that uh, vacancy needs to be filled. <laughs> but we'll see how that goes. And then Wednesday, haircut. One of those days, next week, I need to go for groceries. So it'll be a busy week again. And I really, really want to get a video filmed on how to fix a hole in your fabric. Like if you're, if you were doing the nasty and unstitching stitches and you accidentally um, you accidentally make a hole in your fabric. Like if you use your scissors and cut those stitches out, which I do a lot of times if I have a big area to frog. Um, or even if you're unpicking and you accidentally break a thread. I want to show you how to fix that because all is not lost. A lot of times it can be fixed, and a lot of times it can be fixed that you don't even know that it was fixed. So I also want to show you how to fix if you cut, cut, or if you happen to get a hole in your Aida cloth, because there's also a way to fix that. And I'd like to show you how to fix if you do a miscut in your hard hanger. So my plan is to film all of that next week in between the dentist and the hairdresser and groceries. Somewhere in there. <laughs> they may come out in separate segments, but we'll see how that goes. Um, but that is what's on the table for next week's next week's videos. So look for those. It keeps sliding down here. And uh, that will come out. Let me see how many 
leave any more milk out a half an hour. We'll go with a little bit yet. Because I do have one more thing that I'd like to talk about. And I, I've talked about this before. And it's such a pet peeve of mine. Or should I say something to that just that just puts me over the edge almost every time I hear it. Now, let me preface it with saying that the needlework industry in this case has not done us any favors. needlework industry, I believe, has come up with whether they came up with or they just started using some terminology that is inaccurate. in a lot of ways, or in at least one major way. And it, it just, it just annoys the heck out of me. And whenever I hear it, I, I end up bringing it up when here, because as, as you all, you know, people that have been with me for a while, I really try and present information that is accurate. How do I do that? That's correct. That is informing you of the correct way or and and you know there are things that there is no correct way but when there's a definition and a way to describe something or learn about something i like to give you the most accurate information that i know of am i always right probably not but in this case, I am. And it's just something that, as I said, sends me right over the edge. And that is the use of the term even read. I've seen it or heard it in several videos lately that have explained the term even weave inaccurately. So I'm going to get on my little soapbox here <laughs> and remind everybody that even weave is not its own, does not just mean threads or fabrics where the threads are all even, as in Lugana, as in Jobelin, and that type of fabric where every thread is consistently the same. Yes, they are even weave, but even weave is not, that is not the definition that all their threads are even even in the sense that they're all the same thickness. Even weave by definition is there are the same number of threads horizontally as vertically. So if you're working on 25 count fabric, 
you have 25 threads horizontally, 25 threads vertically, so that when you stitch your X or you stitch 10 by 10, a 10 by 10 square, it comes out square. That is a key phrase. Remember that. When you stitch your 10 by 10 square on a piece of even weave, it comes out square. If you're stitching on an uneven weave, it will either come out tall and skinny or short and fat. But first, I'm going to talk about even weave. By that definition, and this is where I get hung up. By that definition, all of the fabrics that you stitch on for counted cross stitch are even weave. Ada cloth, Lugana, Jobelin, Murano, Newcastle linen, Edinburgh linen. Legacy linen, just to name a few. Congress cloth, mono canvas for needlepoint are all even weave. Why are they even weave? Ada cloth is woven differently. It has multiple threads going in each direction that make up a square. Hardanger fabric is even weave. Why is that even weave? It has two threads and two, two threads horizontally, two threads vertically that make up a square. Why is that even weave? Linen, its threads aren't even. It has fat threads and skinny threads. Why is that even weave? Ladies and gentlemen, it is even weave because there are the same number of threads vertically as horizontally that when you stitch a 10 by 10 block it comes out square if it's not even weave it's going to say something like your linens that are 5260 that's not even weave because that is telling you it has 52 threads in one direction and it has 60 threads in the other direction. And depending upon, upon which way you orient that fabric, you're either going to get tall and skinny or short and squatty. Therefore, that's uneven. Eight o'clock is even weave. It doesn't matter how that cloth is woven in the sense that those squares are made up by four little threads horizontally and four little threads vertically that make up that square. But the number of squares is even, therefore making it even weave. All of your cross stitch fabrics are even weave unless otherwise stated. And if they're not even weave, they're going to give you two numbers. Okay. It's my soapbox, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Drives me crazy every time I hear it. Every time I hear it, I go off the deep end. I feel I have a responsibility to the community to educate you on what is even weave and what is uneven weave. I stitched a Sam, Vicki Clayton at one time had, had a fabric produced, produced that was an uneven weave. I forget exactly what the count was. And I did a Quaker sampler on that 
to which I had it oriented. And that was fine. That's what I wanted. I had it oriented so that my M my medallions, I guess you call them, came out short and wide. I could have oriented it that they came out tall and thin. That's why you see some samplers stitched by the little girls that if you stitch them today on our fabrics, they're going to come out, maybe they're going to come out different shaped because those little girls may be stitched on a fabric that was not even. Sometimes to get that piece to be tall and thin because it was an uneven weave fabric, they might have stitched two, they might have stitched over three. So they might, they might have, their X might have been two threads across, three threads up so that it was longer, higher, and not square. I hope I'm explaining that right. So if they came up in their lower left-hand corner of the square and they're on a piece of linen, instead of going over two to go down, they went over three, they went up three threads. Okay. When they came, or they went, they went up three threads and went, then went down through the fabric. They came up three threads below that so that they had two threads. Okay, here. They came up here. Think of these as a thread. They came up here. They went up one two three over two and went down here then they came back here and came up and went down here so that their x was tall and skinny that helped to make their their finished product come out shaped maybe more square or more rectangular than what it would have been if they just did over two Okay, but my biggest point I want to make is every fabric that you stitch on for counted cross stitch or counted thread work, whether it be hard anger, whether it be pulled thread, whether it be cut work, are even weave unless otherwise stated. They all have the same number of either threads or squares horizontally as vertically. And, and like I said, what really sent me over the edge was the question was asked about is eight a cloth even weave? The answer that was given was no, because it has multiple threads making up the squares. That's not the definition of even weave. Is linen even weave? No, because it has fat and skinny threads. That is inaccurate information. Linen is even weave unless otherwise stated. So I feel like I'm being repetitious here and I am, but I really wanted to get that message across. The industry has done us the disservice by calling those fabrics that are made of, I'm just, I'm going to say blends of fiber and calling those even weave. Is it because they didn't know what else to call them? 
only my personal opinion. What I think should have happened is instead of classifying just those fabrics as even weave, we should just be calling them by their name. We should just be saying Lugana, Murano, Linda Claw, Davos, Jobelin, whatever the manufacturer has named them is what we should be calling them instead of just, instead of clump, clumping them together and calling them even weave. Let's just start saying Lugana. I want to stitch on Lugana. I want to stitch on Murano. I want to stitch on Jobelin. If you don't know which you want to stitch on, maybe you have a shop that would get you or give you small samples of each so that you could try and find out what fabric you like the best. Or maybe you want to stitch this particular project on Jobelin, but you want to do this particular project on Lugana. You know, we all seem to find our favorite fabric, so let's just call them the fabric name and not classify them as even weave. Because the big umbrella of all of these fabrics, Ada's, Jobelin, Lugana, Murano, Congress cloth, mono canvas, linens, the umbrella is even weaves unless otherwise stated. Then it's broken down. We call eight o'clock, eight o'clock. That's the we that's the composition of that fabric. That's how it's woven. So why not call everything else by its manufactured name as opposed to even me? Okay. <laughs> I probably drove my point home a little bit more than I should have. But as you can see, it just it just sends me over the edge. So, sorry, not sorry for being windy about it. I just wanted to make the point so that people can understand what that difference is. And maybe if we as consumers start calling these fabrics by their fabric name, instead of a classification that the industry has given them, maybe we can start to change that. Just maybe. So that's my soapbox for today. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed. <laughs> I'll try not to do it too often, but hopefully Things will start to, people will start to understand that, that, that I won't have to do that so often, but yeah, I, I just can't help myself. It just, just does that to me. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, we have been here for the best part of an hour. So with that, I am going to say. This is a wrap. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Whatever it is that you're going to do today, uh, it looks like it's going to be a wonderful day outside here in Pennsylvania. The sun is shining brightly. I have not been outside yet, so I don't know how warm or cold it is. Um, I think it's supposed to warm up this week again. Our poor trees and plants are so confused. They don't know what to do. They are so confused. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, have a great rest of your weekend. Enjoy your stitching time. Stitch what you love. Love what you stitch. And remember, the only rules in cross-stitch are the ones you make.
for yourself. Bye-bye for now.